Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening. Welcome to the Security Geneva Tour. It's a November edition of the 12 tours to navigate digital Geneva. Each month we look at um, international Geneva through specific digital lenses. And obviously this time, November is time for uh, cyber security. Sometimes it's October, but we decided this one is November. My name is Vladimir Radunovic. I'll be your host on behalf of Diplo Foundation and the Geneva Internet Platform. I'll moderate the the event today and actually i even though geneva is in the background uh, i send my greetings from uh, rather cold belgrade not from geneva and uh, interestingly I'm, I'm sure many of you i know about a uh, number of speakers but also the others are actually not in geneva and that signals the importance i think of this international geneva and its impact on on global developments uh, so please understand this Geneva tour is actually an international walk through the, the Geneva. Well, even if it's online only, um, that we miss some nice real walks to um, Geneva, Jardin Botanique and other places, but it, we are also sheltered from, as I understand, the rather cold weather also in Geneva. The goal of uh, today's discussion uh, is to spotlight um, international effects of the Geneva when it comes to cybersecurity and to explore the cooperation among various actors and, and processes in and around Geneva that have a global effect when it comes to cybersecurity. And I have an honor um, to present uh, our guests today, but also to welcome all of you. Uh, so with us, we have uh, uh, Ms. Francesca Bosco, who is a uh, Chief of uh, Staff and Head of Foresight at Cyber Peace Institute. Uh, Nemanja Neno Malisevic, who is a director of digital diplomacy, corporate, external, and legal affairs of Microsoft, and Lubcho Georginski, a senior advisor for multilateral affairs at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, North Macedonia. Um, what connects them, uh, you'll find out very soon. Uh, my colleague Andriana will help us with the chat moderation. As always, with the Diplo and GIP events, uh, we try to integrate your thoughts uh, through the chat. So please feel free to be as active as you wish with your comments, questions, ideas, experiences, uh, and then I'll make sure that Andreana brings it occasionally to the discussion. What is the plan? Uh, we'll firstly listen to a few of those examples from our guests uh, of their involvement in cybersecurity and related discussions in and around Geneva. Um, uh, we couldn't fit all the actors that are in Geneva related to cybersecurity, obviously within one hour. Some of them have already been featured in other uh, tours that we had, like standardization. Uh, the others will feature in, in future tours. What is more important is that uh, we try to reflect on the Geneva ecosystem in a way when it comes to cybersecurity. And beyond that, of course, you have the Geneva Digital Atlas uh, available on the Digital Watch, so you can browse through all the, the actors to. Um, to remind yourself what's happening in Geneva, who's, who's there and what, what's going on. I'll start uh, directly and I'll firstly uh, give a floor to Francesca. And I hope that's okay with you, Francesca. Uh, the reason is not only because you're a lady and we are always pleased to have ladies in cybersecurity discussions. I think this is really important and things are changing. We're having more and more ladies in this discussion. Uh, but you have a very, very specific focus in a way within the Cyber Peace Institute. Uh, you cover, um, or advocate for evidence-based uh, and, and human-centric approach to analysis of cyber attacks. And then you have a lot of focus on uh, critical infrastructure, particularly health sector and all these yeah. vulnerable sectors. So I'll give you the floor for a few minutes of intro of what you've been up to and the Cyber Peace Institute. And then I'm gonna come back with some, some questions to you, Francesca. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for the for the opportunity. I'm I'm very happy uh, to to share uh, also this uh, this moment. Unfortunately, for now online, hopefully uh, soon in person. Let's put it in this way, uh, together with uh, with the, with the other speakers. And indeed, I think you mentioned a, a very important point that the ecosystem in Geneva is growing, and uh, we are happy to be uh, one of the one of the actors. Uh, that um, are contributing basically to this growing ecosystem. And especially I would like to mention the uh, multi-stakeholder 
other dimension of the ecosystem that is growing in Geneva, because I think uh, we are really benefiting, let's say, um, all of us uh, between the, the sort of like interplay with the uh, very different, between very different actors and that this uh, uh, panel is a very good example of it. So thank you so much for also bringing the uh, civil society organization angle um, to, to the table. As uh, I, I will uh, uh, maybe start uh, uh, saying a couple of words about the, the Institute in itself, and then uh, thank you so much for hinting to um, um, a couple of uh, uh, key points of our approach in terms of like being uh, evidence-led uh, at the, the same time having a human-centric approach, and how I will give a couple of examples of how uh, we are um, um, basically operating and cooperating uh, with Within the Geneva and the Swiss ecosystem and beyond. So the Cyber Peace Institute is an independent and neutral non-governmental organization uh, that um, was uh, launched uh, in, uh, in Geneva at the end of 2019. And our mission is to ensure the rights of people to security, dignity, and equity in cyberspace. We assess the impact of cyber attacks from the human perspective and focusing on people's rights. Um, the, the Institute was born uh, already as a sort of like a multi-stakeholder approach because it was born out of a corporate and philanthropy initiative to basically seek solution to the challenges of technology. Um, at the same time, also to uphold the laws and human rights in cyberspace and also bring in cybersecurity assistance and support to vulnerable communities. And I will, uh, and I will uh, come back to this. Um, as mentioned, the, uh, the Cyber Peace Institute works to safeguard the integrity of the overall online ecosystem by directing assistance to vulnerable victims of larger scale cyber attacks and promoting greater accountability when those attacks violate, violate international expectations and laws. Um, we launched a series of uh, very operational and concrete initiatives that aim as uh, providing assistance, uh, promoting accountability, and advancing responsible behavior in cyberspace um, to ultimately support the resilience uh, of critical civilian infrastructure, as you very well mentioned, Vlada, and uh, uh, protect the most vulnerable population. Um, we have a sort of like pretty unique approach in the civil society ecosystem because we try uh, to basically operate uh, with a sort of like a fourth pillars approach, um, the, the starting with the assisting vulnerable communities. So with the assistance pillar, going into analyzing attacks collaboratively via our analysis function, and then advance the responsible behavior in cyberspace via our advancement team, completing it with our foresight team that is thinking what is going to happen next, considering the challenges posed by um, uh, disruptive technologies. For example, in this moment, we're focusing on artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, concrete examples, uh, that um, uh, can give an idea of uh, um, our programs as well as how we uh, basically um, enact this uh, multi-stakeholder approach within the Swiss ecosystem and also beyond. I would like to start uh, mentioning uh, uh, two projects. One is uh, the uh, Cyber Hub for Healthcare program. I mentioned that, uh, uh, that the Institute was launched at the end of 2019. And actually I always say that we became operational uh, basically during the first wave of the pandemic. So with all the challenges related to that. Um, and um, uh, since the very beginning, so since uh, uh, March, 2020, we have, identify the healthcare sector as one of the most vulnerable, considering the high pressure that they were subject to on one hand for the um, uh, clearly the, the stress that uh, uh, was brought by the uh, pandemic emergency, at the same time making the healthcare sector extremely vulnerable uh, to, uh, to cyber attacks. 
and uh, uh, at the same time also considering the uh, necessary uptake in uh, digital technologies uh, and uh, opening the door to potential new vulnerabilities. So to address this, uh, we started with the Cyber for Healthcare program. Uh, what it means in practical terms. The program encompasses several interconnected projects and initiatives. Notably, we started with a call to governments uh, that uh, gathered uh, nearly 50 global leaders and Nobel Peace Prizes laureates uh, for signing a, a petition to member states, to governments, uh, to push for a collective effort to stop cyber attacks on healthcare infrastructure and personnel. So big first thing was the call to governments, but how we can operationalize that. And within the same program, we started a global hub of expertise, connecting professionals in cybersecurity, in healthcare, international law, forensic investigation, open source intelligence, to provide a free cybersecurity service to healthcare organization. Uh, we launched the specific platform that is called the Cyber for Healthcare. So basically we were doing a sort of like a matchmaking between uh, uh, free cybersecurity services provided by our um, corporate partners to healthcare organizations in need. Thanks to this experience and thanks to assisting basically vulnerable communities, um, we started collecting data and together with the network of um, corporate academic partner and other civil society organization, we recently launched the Cyber Incident Tracer, um, specifically focusing on health. What it is, is a platform providing data-driven understanding of the impact of cyber attacks on the healthcare. And um, it's, it's interesting because we started the discussion with uh, the uh, WHO and we collaborated also with the, with the WHO in terms of like other actors uh, active in, uh, in, in the Geneva ecosystem at the international level. Um, and uh, they have, a, for example, a similar platform that is mapping attacks uh, against, uh, the, against the healthcare from a physical point of view. And so we wanted to complete, let's say, the, 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 the landscape in also providing uh, information about what is happening to uh, the healthcare when it comes to uh, cyber attacks. Um, the, the, this, the, the Cyber Incident Tracer Health is a platform that represents a tool for practitioner, business and political leaders to first and foremost empower them to understand the threats and also to develop better informed policies uh, while fostering a proactive approach towards cybersecurity in the healthcare sector. This is why we have kind of like an evidence led in terms of like data to provide awareness and knowledge. And then on the other hand, also having a, a very much people centric approach because the idea is really to showcase um, what is happening uh, to uh, the various uh, um, uh, entities, organizations, institutions, and ultimately to people when it comes to um, attacks against the healthcare. And um, very briefly, I wanted to mention our experience uh, in terms of uh, um, the uh, Cyber for Healthcare program. And I just want to mention also um, another uh, example of how we collaborate within uh, the multi-stakeholder um, uh, ecosystem that is uh, based in Geneva, in Switzerland and beyond. We also launch a specific uh, program that is called the Cyber Peace Builders. The Cyber Peace Builders, again, starts from the idea of which are the most vulnerable communities. In this case, we have identified NGOs, so other civil society organizations active in the humanitarian and development sector that are under the pressing need to increase their capabilities in cybersecurity to safeguard their operation, their funds and resources, and their data on beneficiaries. And all of this is making them, this sort of like pressing needs um, are making them potentially more vulnerable uh, to cyber attacks. And often they don't have the knowledge, understanding, but also the resources to protect themselves. So the idea of the cyber peace builders is to collaborate with the corporate sector and specifically with volunteers coming from the corporate sector and matchmaking with the needs 
of civil society um, organizations in need. And it's interesting because these volunteers can train and help NGOs that are active in critical civilian sectors, while also building a globally diverse talent pipeline of experts for this work. Um, we are currently onboarding different, uh, um, different companies who want to be enrolled in the program. We launched it in Geneva in July. Um, together with uh, the uh, local chamber of commerce, and uh, we launched the, the global program uh, recently in October during the cybersecurity uh, months. And uh, um, I mean, this is also a call, uh, let's say, for for having many more organizations involved, both from the corporate sector, but also in terms of beneficiaries. So I, I stop here just to give you some food for thought, let's say, in terms of like operational activities on how we can also, uh, let's say, all have a role to play within the Geneva ecosystem, but also internationally and beyond. Thank you so much, Vlada. Thank you, Francesca, and also for the for the open call for, for partnership. We'll get back to this uh, ecosystem and cooperation uh, afterwards. But it's I think what's important is that you outline um, what particular roles civil society can play. We usually understand civil society more as a, the advocacy groups, which you do have part of that. But you also do a lot, and you, you mentioned that convening others together, which is an interesting role of the civil society, collecting and analyzing data and so on and, and so forth. We'll get back to some of those. Let me move on now to Neno. Uh, uh, Neno, I mean, I guess Microsoft was, as far as I understand, the first one who actually had the department for diplomacy back in the years. And I, I don't know if others still have uh, or, or already have something like that. Uh, you have been, as Microsoft, very involved in, in uh, global cybersecurity processes and also very active in Geneva-related processes. Now, from your perspective as Microsoft, and you've come up with all these ideas of Geneva Digital Convention and, and a lot of pressure on international negotiations, how do you see the role of the, not only Microsoft, but more broadly, private sector in Geneva? How active is it? What is it pushing for? And certainly, what is what is Microsoft working on? No, no. Gotcha. Th thank you very much, Vlada. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be, to be part of this panel. Thank you very much for inviting us. So by, by way of context, I, I, I spent a decade plus at the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the OSCE, before joining Microsoft. So I've had the good fortune of doing cybersecurity policy and diplomacy for both the, the, the public and the private sector. And in both roles, I've had a lot of interaction with various international organizations and other such entities. And Geneva is certainly a key hub for diplomacy, be it digital or, or more old school. And Speaking of diplomacy, even after all these years, both at Microsoft and the OEC, it's still fascinating for me to reflect sometimes on just how similar much of the work really is at its core. After all, when you're dealing with people, everything is diplomacy, whether you work for a big company or, or an international organization. And, and one of the key functions of diplomacy, of course, is to bring people together to talk. But that is not enough. It has to be the right people and it has to be the right setting. And I think this is really one of the strengths for hubs such as uh, Vienna, where I live, but also Geneva, especially since both have meaningful UN representations. And even though entities like the UN or the OSC, including during my time there, would receive their fair amount of criticism, I do think they are absolutely essential for exactly this purpose, this fostering of multilateral discussions. Now, as somebody who spent quite a bit of time coming up with and negotiating possible confidence building measures, I can confidently say that there really is no substitute for actual real discussions and negotiations among states and hubs like Geneva provide a critical venue for them and in many ways represent a confidence building measure in and of themselves. Now looking at the big picture, the big global conversation, so primarily at the UN, I think that it is conceptually really important to discuss issues of global importance in a global setting. And clearly, threats emanating from cyberspace cannot be effectively tackled by any one state on their own. So having these types of conversations in a multilateral setting is crucial. That said, I think one of the key issues of our time and building on what Francesca said, especially when it comes to dealing with cyber threats, is that multilateral conversations on their own are likely no longer enough. 
Um, so that there is no confusion, I really want to be super clear on the next bit. Threats emanating from cyberspace cannot be tackled by any state on their own. They cannot be tackled by civil society on their own, and they cannot be tackled by industry on our own. For us to make real progress in this space, we really must work together. We must leverage each other's experience, expertise, and resources so that the outcome is greater than the sum of its parts. And that is why we you know, so strongly believe in the importance of multi-stakeholder diplomacy and the multi-stakeholder community in this space and why we see a lot of merit in initiatives such as, for example, the Paris Call for Trust and Security in Cyberspace that promote multi-stakeholderism writ large, as well as, for example, more targeted initiatives such as, for example, the Oxford process that explores some key questions with a narrower focus. And I think the Paris Call is particularly worth mentioning in this respect, given that it has now grown into the, the largest multi-stakeholder group ever assembled in support of a cybersecurity focused agreement. It brings together 80 governments, more than 35 public authorities and local governments, more than 400 or almost 400 civil society entities and more than 700 companies. So that's more than 1,200 entities in total, which really is a remarkable achievement and clearly shows the appetite that exists for these types of initiatives in this space. Now, while respectful of the unique responsibility that governments have in matters of national security, I think the inherently shared nature of cyberspace really does require collaboration between and across stakeholder groups to protect the safety and integrity of the online world. To be clear, multi-stakeholder diplomacy is not the same as public-private partnerships, and I'll close the loop with Geneva in a second. But Neither does, neither does multi-stakeholder diplomacy mean that industry or civil society get to make decisions that should reasonably be made by governments, nor does it mean that all stakeholders need to consult on all issues all the time, but it means that when an issue is too challenging to reasonably be tackled by any one stakeholder group, all the relevant stakeholders come together for the greater good. And I think threats emanating from cyberspace are absolutely one such issue. And I believe that diplomatic hubs like Geneva play a critical role here too. So I think overall, as we're looking at this, the idea is not to take decision-making power away from states, states take the decisions, but to take the best possible decisions, wouldn't it be really good and helpful to first leverage the expertise and experience of all the relevant stakeholders? Because speaking frankly, when it comes to threats emanating from cyberspace, um, neither the status quo nor the trends are particularly good. Now, in concrete terms, and as previously indicated, Geneva is host to many key entities such as for, that we work with, such as, for example, um, the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research, UNIDIR, whose work we highly value, to give just one example. In terms of other entities, we, of course, strongly support the work of the Cyber Peace Institute. It's great to see Francesca here. And we are, for example, very proud of a recent partnership staying in the healthcare realm that brings together the Czech government, the CPI and Microsoft with the aim to protect the healthcare sector from cyber harm. Um, speaking of healthcare in Geneva, we're of course great admirers of the work done by the International Committee of the Red Cross, including in the area of international law. Um, we're also involved in a capacity building initiative within the framework of the Internet Governance Forum called Our Digital Future. Um, and another Geneva-based endeavor really worth mentioning is of course the so-called Geneva Dialogue, uh, led by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which is also highly relevant in terms of a multi-stakeholder initiative. And, and last, but certainly not least, it's, it's entities such as um, you know, the Diplo Foundation that maintain offices in Geneva and contribute to it being such a valued hub. Um, but, and I will close with this, the mere existence of diplomatic hubs, as well as multilateral or multi-stakeholder entities and initiatives, I think is not enough. I think in an environment as fast paced and dynamic as cyberspace, and certainly when it comes to threats emanating from cyberspace, I think really all stakeholders need to realize that they not only need to do more, but that they need to do more together. Thank you, Vlada, back to you. Thank you, Nano, uh, and thanks for praising Tipo's work as well. I think it was it was very useful again to, to uh, underline, we all know or understand more and more the, the, the strength and the importance of the private sector, but what exactly private sector can do, and you outlined some very important bits in this multi-stakeholder diplomacy is, is, is critical to, to, to understand. Uh, and you mentioned this global character of the challenges, uh, of the risks, that obviously no state can defend on its own. Vast majority of infrastructure services is actually owned by the private sector. The private sector is the one who actually has the knowledge and, and the hands-on uh, to protect the system. So it's it's a very important uh, remark. We'll get back to more of the role of the private sector. Uh, I want to move on to, now to something a little bit 
uh, commonly out of the framing of cybersecurity as we see it usually. Uh, and I bring in uh, Lubcu Georgiski. I mentioned he's a senior advisor uh, at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of North Macedonia. But I think what actually stands out is that he's a former chair of a group of governmental experts on little autonomous weapon systems, which was formed under the convention on certain, uh, certain conventional weapons. Now, uh, this is a, a combination of uh, artificial intelligence and um, weaponry. And as we know, everything that has a code and can be connected can also be hacked. And that's where we come to this connection of cybersecurity discussions with little autonomous weapons. Now, Lubcho, I'll firstly give you a, a, a brief intro into, because everything was mainly set in Geneva, what has been happening? What, is the, what are the key lines of your work within the, the GG laws? And then you can also reflect on this connection of autonomous weapons with cybersecurity. Lubcho, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Vlada, and thank you uh, to the previous speakers who really set a, a, a very uh, good context for our conversation. And it's, it's quite indicative of, of what Geneva really is. Uh, we have uh, a civil society, academic kind of uh, voice that has uh, given its feedback on, on, on our cyber issues. Um, the private um, uh, voice as well, which is quite important and has been missing, and it's a, it's a, it's a warm welcome. Uh, that is here. Um, Jovan knows he's here, I see, and, and many others who have been involved over uh, the past decades, really, in this issue, that in the beginning, uh, I guess, private was a, a bit ambivalent in terms of uh, connecting to, to these issues, because they saw as uh, this, the multilateral was a dirty word uh, in that sense. But it's no longer so, because uh, it's seen that the costs are quite high when there isn't cooperation, including on private sector. So we have good private leadership, Microsoft uh, obviously uh, is uh, first among them, I, I would have to say, even with the idea of, uh, of a Geneva um, framework for discussion uh, to begin with. But in discussing autonomous weapons, and, and, and I will focus on that, um, it, it, it's really the time has come for, for that kind of involvement for, other, for, for the private sector private, uh, specifically, because civil society has been uh, in, involved in this. So as you, as you correctly said, uh, lethal autonomous weapon systems are happening within uh, a Geneva framework, which is called the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons. This is um, the uh, really uh, the best example of what international humanitarian law is um, in, in, one, in one treaty. And but it's, it's worth remembering that it didn't start in the disarmament section of Geneva. It started in another room in Geneva, the Human Rights Council, where the Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Killings um, in eight years ago uh, now had raised concerns both over the use of drones, uh, but then because this started to become an issue be, uh, in terms of autonomy in, in, in the decision. So an algorithm deciding when to kill, uh, et cetera. So it was from the human rights, from one side of the Palais de Nation in Geneva that it got transformed into the, the disarmament discussions in the convention of certain conventional weapons. The, what we're, where we are right now is um, after two years of meeting of experts and then uh, five years now of a group of governmental experts discussions is that we've uh, reached, uh, uh, first of all, quite, um, a few of different types of um, um, low-hanging fruits, if they may be called so. Uh, one is tempted to say that the guiding principles are such, and they are. It is quite uh, a big advancement that we were able uh, in 2019 to uh, adopt the guiding principles, 11 of them. Uh, uh, and, but but it's also we've looked at something that is called Article 36 Weapons Reviews, which has been by, called by many the most thorough uh, consideration of weapon reviews, uh, one of the toolkits in the Geneva Conventions and the uh, additional protocols uh, of, of any. So in any other context that has been, this is the place where we've discussed how a weapon review that has autonomous functions would go. What are the good practices? What are the uh, what are uh, aspects that can be can be looked at? We've looked at the possibility of, of uh, creating a body of law similar to the Montreal uh, type uh, document that is for private uh, industry, pri private militaries, uh, and, 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 and mapping it in one so that we can see what is the international law of all kinds that applies specifically to autonomous weapons and not just lethal autonomous weapons. And, and we've been able to do that in a very flexible manner. So anytime we've come to uh, 
any kind of a roadblock, we've been able to go around it. We got stuck on definitions. We went around it. We, we focused the discussion on uh, uh, what is uh, what are the characteristics of these weapons. We got stuck in negotiations of what should be the mandate and uh, should we start negotiating a little instrument or, or not. And the interests are obviously very strong on both sides. Uh, we went around that as well. And uh, again, uh, I proposed a, a, a phrase and which was a normative framework. It then became consideration, clarification, and development of aspects of the normative and operational framework. So we've been able to do these things flexible and to keep on going uh, further and deeper into each of the issues. But now we are ahead of the review conference. The group of governmental experts is uh, having its discussion in the context, as I said, of the CCW. The CCW is a convention that has annual meeting of states parties and um, uh, quintennial, so after every five years, review conferences. This is the year that we are having a review conference, um, which will be preceded, by the way, by meetings of the group of governmental experts, the last one in this process, which will begin on the 7th, uh, 2nd of December and go until the 8th. And this is the final push. So we've had guiding principles that have been adopted. We had uh, weapon reviews. We've had uh, creating a body of laws. We've had discussions on a code of conduct. We've had all these issues. And now what do we do with it? And what do we do with the, with the group in the next five years, in the next period of, uh, until the, the review conference? So as I said, 2nd to 8th December is the group of governmental experts, the last meetings. And then immediately after, 13th to 17th December is the review conference. If anything is to be cited, it's going to be them. And it, it, is, it is really indicative, as I said, of Geneva that this, this conversation is going on. Um, uh, to begin with, again, as this panel quite uh, well demonstrates, but also because of the bodies. You're in your intro video, you have these dots uh, of all the things that are happening. Similarly, when I, was, when I finished sharing, I created a little video with my own parting thoughts. I'll share it here which exactly also says that, you know, Geneva is the place to have this conversation. And I will end by saying that the reason I emphasize that, because the alternative of something not happening during the review conference of, of really not having a substantive outcome is that this process might get out of Geneva or partly get out of Geneva. And as has happened with cluster munitions, as has happened with landmines, I would, I would mention in the same breath, although it's not from the CCW nuclear weapons, the ban to, to the use of nuclear weapons, um, they've all gone out of Geneva, went into, well, New York, or but, but toward a negotiation of a treaty. And that seemingly is, is a good um, um, prospect for many who think that there should be some kind of a legally binding instrument. But it's worth remembering that if that is the case, that the biggest militaries won't take part in that. And one would have a process without the biggest militaries. So it's really important that the process stays in Geneva, but it's also equally important that it's a substantive one. So I'll end with that and I'll just share here the, the video that I mentioned and I'm open for all thoughts uh, from here. Thanks. Thanks, Lucho. A uh, kind of reminder for everyone that on the Digital Watch, we also have, we follow closely the process of GG laws. And what I like about uh, Geneva is it, it, it plays this role of, of a melting pot of ideas, topics, stakeholders, and in a way cooks or prepares the main ingredients for uh, usually negotiations on the highest level in the in the in the New York uh, and so on. But uh, and we we could continue discussing this connection between autonomous weapons and and uh, cyber norms. What I can promise is that we'll follow up with different um, meetings or, or webinars in future, including with Luke Cho to connect cyber norms with other processes like GG laws and space and the others. But let me, uh, at the moment, stop or focus, and I'll okay, directly get back to you, Lubcho, now. Uh, on the roles of various other stakeholders in Geneva, um, such as, as you've heard, let's say, Cyber Peace Institute or private sector like Microsoft, uh, in, in the future of maybe the past and the future of discussions of GG laws, how could other stakeholders, what are the other stakeholders, particularly from those cybersecurity areas in Geneva that could maybe uh, help shaping better the future of the, of the GG laws process in this cyber component? Well, uh, again, thanks for, for, the, for that question. And then I'll, I'll, I'll stick to the, to the autonomous weapons discussion to illustrate this because uh, let me uh, just kind of give the reason why, because one of, the, even though it's not 
within the part of the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons, there are different aspects of autonomy in weapon systems. One of them is the combination of, of cyber um, uh, instruments. So I mean, all the other ones where you have machine learning is together with a type of weapon, uh, whether it is on land, uh, on water, underwater, on air, in space. Um, these are all an algorithm plus machine learning plus uh, some kind of a, a, a machine, um, uh, a drone or a ship. So that's a robot that we're talking about. But there's also the aspect of cyber, where we have uh, cyber agents, which are which are uh, completely, let's say, within cyberspace. And, and they have the autonomy to be able to, uh, for instance, uh, react in a given context without human intervention. So if a given context happens. So uh, when, when you have something like that, it is really private industry that has the most experience in these kinds of things. And, and it is also private industry that has the most experience in, in, in autonomy, um, whether it is autonomy in, in, in vehicles for cars or uh, autonomy that has been uh, used in, in, in military as well, since there is a, a connection. Uh, as Project Maven uh, really in, in illustrates, um, uh, there is a connection between private industry and military. So it is really important that the private voice to be able to to be able to understand these issues better. Um, it, 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 it is the private sector that can best uh, uh, really explain it. One example that, that is sometimes uh, offered is the use of swarms, right? So I mean, um, the, the the use of swarms is. Uh, a, a new type of using these machine machine learning where you have, let's say, a swarm of drones, which are learning by themselves to be able to react in, in given context. That has uh, consequences both in terms of the conversation I had before about um, uh, weapon reviews. So, I mean, are you do you need to do a legal weapon review every time you have a drone take flight and, and relearn something? Because it's a new behavior after that, right? But also in terms of understanding it, you know, the understanding what is called the black box problem. So we're with with the new tools in machine learning we have, we can see perhaps the context, give it a certain uh, sets of data, and we control that, uh, with, including our prejudices with it. And then we have the output of the machine learning process, and we can analyze that. But really, we 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 don't have too much insight in terms of how algorithms do that very often, and it is the experience of private industry that can best. Uh, be able to help such processes as the one on autonomous weapons, because it's quite important to be able to understand these distinctions, as you may well uh, uh, imagine. It's 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 one thing uh, to be able to to have a weapon like that and and and, and use it, and, and it's quite another to understand exactly why that is the case. And to close this point, it is exactly the context of the group of governmental experts that provides a framework for these kinds of discussions because it provides the possibility of civil society, of academics and private industry to jump into the conversation and enrich it, to be able to describe exactly why something has been, has been happening. And that is beneficial because in the absence of that, you have major militaries uh, who would be uh, inclined to not participate, to go their own ways and develop uh, these weapons in their own kind of backyards without really allowing uh, others to see what's going on. And that is the most dangerous possible path. <laughs> that is the pos path of ambiguity, where none of the big militaries have a forum for diplomatic signaling, even military posturing, uh, and, and they develop these weapons in secret. Uh, and and that's, that's something that these kind of fora allow, and it's the type of voices that is that are not just diplomats, that are not just military, that is not just parliamentarians who are increasingly uh, entering the field, but it's also academic voices and it's also private sector uh, voices who are enriching it. Well, thanks for frightening us a little bit more. I think uh, these sort of warnings are, are quite, quite important. What I liked, and you, you said it before even, uh, is that the whole discussion originated from the human rights perspective, then it went to security and it touched upon uh, new technology. And that this complexity of the field describes um, the a lot of space and potential for many actors to actually get in and help help the process. Um, before I pass the floor further, I want to invite you uh, to share your thoughts and comments and questions in the chat. Uh, I'll get back to, to Michael's comment in a, in a, in a minute. Uh, so use the opportunity and then I'll also invite Andriana to, to uh, reflect what's happening in the, uh, in the chat. <clears throat> but I quickly want to hear firstly from Nano and then from Francesca. Nano, no, um, you've just mentioned uh, the important role of the private sector. Okay obviously in the field of laws, but generally in the field of 
regulating the, the governing the technologies and so on. Now, my question to you is, Microsoft is, is a, uh, probably one of the rare examples of companies that are so active in, in the, at least the cyber norms and cybersecurity field in general. What is the potential really, the, the capacities of the private sector in and around Geneva, or at least to be involved in, in discussions like the GGE or norms that we had, cyber norms that we had also cooking in Geneva in previous years, and the GGE laws and other um, developments in Geneva. So beyond your Microsoft in general, how do you see the, the capacities of a private sector presence in these processes? Thanks, Vlada. So again, I feel a lot of this, if you, if you go back to, to a bunch of years now, again, as a, this is for me personally, this is my eighth year with, with the company. And I'll be perfectly honest, like when I was at the, at the OSC, I didn't really plan on making the switch to the, to the private sector at the time. I thought my trajectory is going to continue to the UN or NATO, European Union, some, 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 something, something like that. So when I was approached at the time and I realized that there's a team like the one that, that I work for and have worked since I joined the company that focuses on digital diplomacy, for me personally, that was eye-opening in terms of just what the private sector can and should possibly be doing in this space. Because ultimately, I feel a lot of these conversations that are happening when it comes to threats emanating from cyberspace, I, I, I hinted at that before, Lupcho mentioned it, Francesca mentioned it, the scope of what we're seeing and we're not this this is what i'm saying is was correct yesterday it's definitely correct today but if we're looking at the threats as they are evolving both in terms of scale and sophistication it's only going to become more true it is beyond the capabilities of any one stakeholder group to meaningfully address those challenges so that's why again i think the advocacy piece for us for other industry players in this space when it comes to the work of you know the traditionally the ggees have been more it's certainly the ones on cyber norms have been more closed affairs, but there have been other entities such as the open-ended working group. And there's talks of, of, of a program of action now at the UN. And again, there's, there's a lot of talk in this space. And I think all of this would benefit from a meaningful multi-stakeholder participation. You look at something like the Paris Call for Trust and Security in Cyberspace that from the outset was intended to be open to not just states, but also to industry and civil society. And you see kind of the, 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 the amount of entities that have come out and spoken out in support of it. I think that sends a clear message that there really is an appetite for these types of conversations. And again, just because of Microsoft's history in this space, I do want to reiterate something I said earlier before. None of this takes away the decision-making power of states. I think it enhances, and I think that sums it really up. All of this is to enhance the decision-making power of states so that when they ultimately decide and negotiate these things, they can take the best possible decisions. And I'll close with, a, with, with, with something more concrete. As you're looking at these technologies, as they're evolving, as they're developing, the pace is such that it's impossible essentially to, to keep track of it unless you bring in the folks that are responsible for these types of innovations. And so, so that so that you can keep covering and so that the stuff that you actually negotiate is applicable to the real world and not just today, but also going forward. So I feel that kind of is where a lot of this benefit really is coming from and why we've so strongly been advocating for this idea of a multi-stakeholder diplomacy in this space. Thanks, Anna. And actually, the, 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 one of the questions by Michael in, in, in the chat reflects on that, how do we get more of the private sector beyond Microsoft present in Geneva? And I think you just response in, in that regards related to finding the interests of the private sector into the processes is the key. I'll, I can share a, a bit of the experience from the Geneva dialogue that you mentioned, which is basically a, a Swiss supported initiative, which, which I in a way uh, coordinate on behalf of Diplo. Uh, we, we get at a number of leading companies, global companies, Microsoft being among, among them, but also Kaspersky, Huawei, FireEye, Cisco, Siemens, and, and many others, um, to try to reflect on how to um, enhance the security of digital products. Now that seems how to reduce vulnerabilities in the, in the cyberspace, which are basically the key uh, element of, uh, of uh, sophisticated cyber attacks. Now that seems sort of a technical discussion, but what we managed to do throughout the process and building trust among them is to connect their practices on securing digital products with cyber norms, regulations, standards, and so on to, to broaden this perspective of how uh, companies see their own work and that they ultimately realize that what they do in their everyday life, in a way, contributes directly to the implementation of international norms and, 
and uh, and principles in a way and other way around that they can with their experience and and knowledge impact the shaping of these of these environments so certainly finding connecting the dots and finding this interest i noted a couple of other questions but let me just quickly go back to francesca francesca uh a question is similar to you uh or for you uh what what is the capacity what are the capacities of the civil society organizations and more broadly in geneva to what extent you are actually linked to and maybe can even have can attract more of the private sector actors to geneva through all of your different products so who do you cooperate with how you how you manage to 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 run through this ecosystem in geneva just unmute yourself yeah thank you so much <laughs> Thank you so much for the for the question. And uh, I was also looking at the chat, and 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 I really like, let's say, uh, the, um, the, the 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 let's say the way that the conversation is going because I think uh, we are all spotting two important aspects. One is um, basically make this. Um, different uh, initiatives. Uh, um, I mean, uh, Neno mentioned the Geneva Dialogue. We are also part of it. Uh, and uh, uh, I see that in the chat, we are discussing the, uh, the, the Paris Peace Call and for example, also uh, the, um, uh, the, for example, the uh, Christchurch call uh, that uh, we are, uh, we're currently applying to. So the point is to make these initiatives known. And this is also thanks to event like this one. So I already, uh, let's say, praise your effort here because the first, uh, is raising awareness that this initiative exists and that there is the possibility to collaborate, to cooperate. But then also, as also Luko is mentioning in the chat and Nano mentioned it before, in a very concrete way, in very concrete terms. And let me give you a, a couple of examples. So um, I, I would like to start with uh, one example of something that as civil society organization we've taken on board in terms of like how we can collaborate with the different sectors. So for example, on the 30th of September, the Cyber Peace Institute and the Cybersecurity Tech Accord um, have uh, released a multi-stakeholder manifesto on cybercrime. So basically linking the ongoing uh, uh, discussion at the UN level uh, with uh, uh, some, some needs, uh, basic advocacy needs uh, felt by the civil society entities together with over uh, 60 industries and individuals committed to a free, open and secure internet. Um, the manifesto comes ahead of the in, impending UN negotiations uh, um, around an updated convention on cybercrime, uh, which are set to begin in January. So this is a, a, a concrete example of how um, we civil society organization can collaborate with the corporate sector, also with the interested individuals. And now the manifesto is open to signature for everyone. I will post it in the chat. Conscious about time, I also want to mention that this is something that is like, kind of like stemming from Geneva, let's say where we are based, but clearly the aim, and you will see some Geneva-based entities, like for example, the Swiss Digital Initiative who already signed the manifesto and, and some companies that are based in Geneva that signed the manifesto as well. So they are supporting the effort. So it's a good example of how something that we started, let's say in Geneva, has a definitely um, a, a, an international and broader scope. And then I just want to make a couple of examples in terms of like, there are different ways that as a civil society organization, we are engaging, let's say with, within the Swiss ecosystem. Um, I mentioned before the uh, healthcare uh, sector and the healthcare kind of like related work stream. For example, we are in touch with the Geneva Digital, with the Geneva Health Hub, with the Health Valley, and with the Campus Biotech. That, and uh, um, we are uh, currently um, working on uh, uh, an event that will take place uh, on the 8th of December to basically bring all these actors together um, and uh, uh, also to foster the cooperation. Uh, with uh, different uh, uh, Geneva-based uh, initiatives uh, uh, and uh, to link it more with uh, the uh, corporate environment that was also mentioned in the chat. But then we don't need to forget the two important aspects. One is uh, the, uh, for example, the SDGs discussion. So how we can uh, uh, basically uh, promote um, uh, also initiatives that are in line with the achievement of the Agenda 2030. And for this reason, we are, for example, collaborating with the SDG Hub 
here in, in, in Geneva. And uh, uh, last but not least, also how we can basically promote the good practices that uh, we are surfacing here within the uh, Geneva and Swiss ecosystem, also abroad for having a sort of like uh, how we can uh, contribute to the global community. And uh, I would mention here, for example, uh, the, um, the collaboration with uh, Swiss Next and uh, Present Swiss. So just to give some food for thought also uh, and some practical examples of how we can all engage with the different actors. Thanks. Uh, and I, I think it's, it's really good to, to hear that the actors are connected. Uh, there is uh, the, the other side of that coin that we are seeing more and more um, initiatives coming up, uh, not just the proposals for agreements, manifestos uh, and, and, and so on. But also things are popping up in different places and they're covering different parts. And that builds on what, what Jovan also uh, asked in the chat. So his question was related to how do we connect Geneva with other places where things are happening? Paris, as a notable example of Paris uh, well, Peace Talk and, and uh, Paris Call and uh, uh, Christchurch Call. Um, Vienna, where things are going to happen when it comes to, or partially at least, uh, cybercrime negotiations. Of course, the CBMs of the OSC and many other places where, where things happen, New York, not least. Uh, so, uh, Neno, maybe, maybe a quick reflection to you. How do you see that interplay, particularly because you've been involved also in, in the Vienna dy dynamics and so on, how do you see, could or should Geneva be, be play that role of a melting pot really and connecting the dots, or is just one of the pieces and how do we enhance this sync between the, the hubs? So, look, I, I think in general, and this, Again, reflecting both on the, the, the now almost decade with Microsoft and the decade plus with, with the OEC, I think generally, and I've heard this argument and this question, like we have so many initiatives, is this good or bad? Overall, my take on all of this is always more conversation is always better than less conversation. And I think there's a lot of benefit that you can have from having these types of conversations happening in a variety of these melting pots, because sometimes you run into a snag in, in one of those melting pots, but perhaps you can resolve it in another. It's still, diplomacy is still a game of people. So perhaps sometimes, you know, you just have a better set or, or more compatible set of people that can talk about something in one setting, and perhaps, you know, they can then continue it in, in, in another setting. I think for, for Geneva-based entities in general, like if you are a practitioner in Geneva, whether you're in the private sector, civil society, or in the diplomatic space, I think, it's, it's a great first step to perhaps, you know, build those relations on the ground within the hub that Geneva provides you to become involved in these conversations. I think it is easier today than it was, say, 10 years ago for a private sector or civil society entity to, to become involved in these types of conversations. If you look at the last OEWG, for example, um, again, there were opportunities to contribute. We would have all wished for them for there to have been more, but I felt, you know, but realistically looking at at how Ambassador Lauber and his and his and his team approached this, there was a lot of scope for transparency and input from various stakeholders in these types of discussions. So perhaps there, could, there one could push for something similar in upcoming conversations, whether it's on on cybercrime, whether it's on the, within the new open-ended working group. So overall, I feel a lot of it can start with this personal well awareness that these processes are ongoing, the willingness to contribute, and then you know trying to become. Uh, to, to, to take part in these, in these conversations. Again, I feel all of these diplomatic hubs, whether it's New York, Vienna, Geneva, others, um, has a tremendous role, role to play. I, I'm, I'm really not that worried about, about the, the, the duplication in this space. I'm more worried about, I, I really think there's a great potential for, to, to enhance and foster these types of conversations and have them all contribute to the overall picture as, as, it's, as it's ultimately shaping up. Thanks, Neno. Yeah, and, and we haven't even mentioned uh, Brussels, which is which is a big, uh, big uh, kitchen of, sure. of practical uh, and, and sort of setting the standards. Or, uh, Lucha, I want to get back to you. Certainly, you can reflect on this discussion thus far. But there is another angle that I want to ask you. Uh, since you come from uh, from well, you're a diplomat from a small country uh, with this variety of processes which are popping up only on security issues, and let alone now you have the the laws aspects and, and the human rights aspects, it seems that uh, there is quite a challenge for small countries and probably even others and other stakeholders to actually put that all together and, and decide where to, where to go. And we have questions directly from diplomats coming to Geneva 
where should I go to, to follow cybersecurity discussions? And there is no single answer to that. So do you see that as a bigger and bigger challenge? And do you see any sort of a Geneva's role in helping that? Well, thanks, Vlad. I, and, and let me start with your, your second question on, on, on small state diplomacy, and, and then also perhaps look back in, into the conversation that has been going on, which is a quite interesting one, both here and in the chat. Um, I, I think that for small states, um, you know, not to really uh, play too much on, on, on this uh, existing um, uh, play on, on the Chinese character, the challenges or opportunities, but it's indeed so. If As much as uh, following and, and really participating in anything that is going on in Geneva is a challenge, it's equally an opportunity to be able to do so. Uh, because there's so many fora and all are, uh, are equal uh, at the end of the day. It's a matter of how much one decides to uh, take part in. And I have to say, I mean, really, uh, Diplo has been amazing at providing uh, these kinds of fora where everybody who hasn't been able to follow the discussions uh, in, a, in, in really in, in any of the halls that are going on in Geneva, to be able to come to uh, such an event and really understand the state of play of so many different issues, to be able to quickly uh, get a glimpse of it and to be able to know exactly where their interests are, to be able to send to their ministries, well, this is how we see things, perhaps this is a way for us to position ourselves and then to have that. So it, it is really, uh, the opportunities are there to both be informed and to participate actively. And, uh, uh, you know, Diplo, Ashayede, uh, Cyber Peace Institute here, so many different uh, uh, fora in, in Geneva allow for small state diplomats to jump in. Now to come back to, to this uh, previous discussion in terms of um, uh, that Jovan raised in the chat and, and ha has been going on in terms of, you know, the Paris peace talks, the, uh, all the other uh, f f uh, places where issues that are of relevance of being discussed in Geneva are raised, how do they look back in Geneva, if at all? And, and that really comes back to the broader in interest. How do, we, how do we solve complex problems uh, in a multilateral setting? Uh, it, it doesn't matter if it is Geneva or Vienna or New York. Um, and, and, and for that, I think that there's two uh, critically important uh, aspects. The first one is for main stakeholders to see their interest in it, to be able to be part of it. And as I said earlier, um, uh, really, I think that Microsoft has been uh, a leader among them to see its own interest in this. It, it, it obviously has. And, and and I can say that, you know, as much as perhaps a government representative cannot control about talk about control because somebody was, oh, government, you know, multilateral evil, uh, I, I, perhaps private cannot talk about, about interest. Well, let me, let me put that away. It's a critical thing to understand interests. If one doesn't understand one's own interests, then, you know, they, they don't have a job. And that's as much true for private uh, sector as much as, as much as it is for diplomats. So when countries and private sector and academics see an interest in the process, they engage. So it's about having that interest and communicating that interest. And that's, that's actually something that we as diplomats have been very bad at um, in all four. You know, uh, I keep on uh, using the example of, for instance, the Biological Weapons Convention, which I chaired uh, in 2018, and similarly with its, the CCW, which I chaired afterward. They both have a budget of $1.5 million a year or whatever you want to make it. That's just ridiculous. I mean, but, but that's uh, indicative of how much states are ready to invest in a process. And it's also indicative of how badly we've communicated what they do to the global audience. If the budget of the Biological Weapons Convention is the same price as one Tomahawk missile, then something is, is, is really wrong. And I would say that the Biological Weapons Convention provides a lot more security for the world, including for the United States or any major player, than one missile. So uh, I'm not, not to single out any big country here because they all take very active part in this, but it's really about the conventions and making them really stronger. So it's about interest and it's about showing that interest within the context of new science and technology advances, which are just at a blazing speed all across the spectrum, whether it is autonomy, whether it is bioengineering, whether it is gene editing, whether it is whatever of the main, many, many, you know, quantum computing, uh, Internet of Things, all of these are happening so fast that we cannot allow them just to happen without any discussion or any framework. That is not automatically to talk about regulation. Uh, let me be clear. It's about really having a framework for discussion uh, for this. But then the second aspect that I mentioned, so the first one is to create an interest for that discussion. The second is equally important for there to be results out of those discussions, whatever they are. And, and there are actually many, many examples of, of, of a, uh, results of 
solutions to practical problems, which again, we're not good at communicating. I doubt that many know that, for instance, the UNECE um, in, in Geneva, which is a regional body of the UN, but it has been mandated by the UN to provide something for the world. And that is the legal framework for autonomous vehicles, right? So a regional body has been tasked with this. And we're very far from any country having a legal framework for that, never mind uh, having it at the global level. But a UN body is already working on that. And that's quite extraordinary. And we have not communicated that uh, so well. Um, in whichever body you see, WTO, you know, trade issues that are being discussed in, 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 in Geneva, human rights. I, I can say personally, I've been involved in those both as a member state when my country was a member of the, you know, of the Human Rights Council. There are practical things that are being done in the Human Rights Council that have consequences in terms of how countries behave afterwards. And I've seen that many, many, many times. So that also needs to be communicated, that there is a body at the global level which takes decisions and takes action, which then have practical consequences in human rights, in trade, in labor, international labor organization, in health, the World Health Organization, uh, intellectual property, World Intellectual Property Organization. All of these organizations that are in Geneva are doing tremendous work, which have practical consequences all over the world, including nationally. Uh, and, you know, we haven't been able to communicate it. That. So that also satisfies the second aspect, and it needs to really keep on doing that, to solve practical problems. Uh, and when those two uh, uh, aspects are well covered, providing interest and uh, having all stakeholders take part in it, and then taking meaningful uh, deliberations, which have results, then I'm sure that uh, uh, there's going to be a lot more interest in all the processes that are going on in Geneva, in Vienna, in New York, uh, uh, in, in all over, in, in multilateral, multi-stakeholder. Thanks, Uncher. I think this communication element is, uh, is, is, is one of the very important ones. And also you mentioned the uh, finances, but that's a, that's a different topic in itself, uh, in general. Uh, our time is up. Uh, I would uh, quickly come back, well, with the, with the tweet literally to Francesca, if you wish. Um, uh, your tweet to invite those that are not in Geneva currently, but should be more engaged uh, to Geneva. Uh, how would you invite them in the tweet one? Oh, wow, that's a, that, <laughs> that's a challenging one. You're cornering me. Um, uh, first of all, to, uh, I mean, to, to make your voice heard, meaning that uh, uh, I think it's, uh, it's very relevant uh, what also Luca and, and, and Nena were, were mentioning, meaning that uh, it's not enough just to mention, oh, there are too many initiatives that we don't have time to follow. Let's uh, try uh, maybe to select the initiatives, but then uh, to really engage. I think uh, uh, the opportunities are here and we show them, but then we also need uh, uh, concrete engagement and we need, uh, I would say, even workforce, basically, uh, to make these initiatives not just be good on paper or on website, uh, but also to have some very uh, uh, concrete and tangible results. And, uh, and so my call to action would be not only to follow the different initiatives, but also to concretely engage and the use uh, the various actors, like respectively, for example, um, within international organization, corporate sector and civil society actors uh, to basically find the best angle uh, to practically engage. Thank you, Francesca. It was more of a Facebook post, but it was really uh, summing up summing up the discussion, and I think it was very useful. Uh, we've come uh, to the end of the discussion today. We'll definitely continue with this discussion. We'll make sure that we build up on some of those uh, issues raised. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, stay tuned uh, for our next uh, month's tour, and of course, get back to Digital Watch at any point you want to reflect more on this. Thank you all for coming, uh, and thank you, all three of you, for contributing and see you see you soon if not earlier than tomorrow for the monthly briefing on internet governance uh, at the same place thank you bye bye thanks a lot thanks so thanks for having us great cheers thank you thanks bye -bye. So bye
just to say that that is a cool video. Just throwing that your throwing that your way. <laughs> I really did enjoy that. <laughs> well, it, we used to have a, 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 a little bit worse music than this. It was more of troubling one. This one is really good. <laughs> I, I like this one. I, that's why I stayed on to watch it again. So no, this was cool. I hope a lot of the, the the event was what you what you wanted it to be. I enjoyed this conversation. Well, I think that's the point. I enjoyed it, and that's that's the point. I think it was it was definitely useful, uh, at least building up on. on uh, but we'll have to continue. <laughs> This, this is like one of those. It's great when you have like in many comedy films, you know, they, they finish and then they they show the Continue. shots how they've been made and then the, you know the the blo bloopers that have been bloopers. made. So. Recording stopped. <laughs> the recording yeah. is stopped. Good. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh. Cool. See you. All right. All right. Have a good yeah, one. Bye. Ciao, Vinus. Ciao. 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 I'm watching you guys. <laughs> <laughs>